Travelling in time is a particular theme in 1960s and 1970s children's literature associated with haunting landscapes, archaeological sites and historical artefacts. Landscape is a key element of these stories, frequently reflecting the isolation of the main characters, from bleak coastland to a deserted village hidden in woodland. There are any number of authors that you could talk about in this context, but I have chosen to focus particularly on the work of Robert Westall and Penelope Lively. They both draw on these themes in their books for children, but while they were award winners at the time their books were written, I think they're a little underappreciated now. The time travel experienced in these books occurs in different ways, but is deeply connected to the memory of past events in the locations where the frequently isolated protagonists find themselves. It does not always occur in the same way. The main characters may be totally immersed in the past, either as helpless bystanders or given a direct role in the action, or they may just pick up on the echoes of past lives. This quote from Christopher Tilly reflects the way that landscapes are used in these books, the characters picking up on the spirit of place in different ways, as can be seen by the quote from Penelope Lively there, with Maria, the main character, in a stitch in time. Just a little background on my authors. Robert Westall was born in North Shields and grew up in Tyneside during the Second World War. Wartime Tyneside was the setting for um, many of his novels for children, beginning with The Machine Gunners in 1975. The book was set in Garmouth, a fictionalised Tynemouth, where he returned in other novels, including The Watch House, which I'll talk about uh, in a little while. Westall was inspired to become a writer by reading stories to his son Christopher about the Second World War. Sadly, Christopher was killed in a motorbike accident at the age of 18 but in 1978, and he in fact became the inspiration for some of Westall's books, including The Devil on the Road and The Haunting of Chas McGill. Penelope Lively spent her childhood in Egypt, but later settled in Oxfordshire. She also writes for adults, but first achieved success with children's fiction. Her first book, Astacote, was published in 1970 and was followed by more than 20 others. She achieved particular recognition with The Ghost of Thomas Kemp and A Stitch in Time, for which she won the 1976 Whitbread Children's Book Award. The three novels, Astacote included, roughly um, feature local history, roughly 600, 300 and 100 years in the past, in ways that approach time slip but do not feature direct travel to the past. The children and young adults in stories by Westall, Lively and others of this period are often removed from their familiar circumstances. They are either with their rarely seen parents in a location away from the family home or staying with relatives or family friends. This seems to be an important theme in these books where time slips or brushes with the uncanny occur. The isolation felt by the protagonists makes them more open to these experiences. Lively may have based some of the characters' feelings in these stories on her own experience of moving from Egypt to Britain with her family as a child. She said, It is true that when I came here at 12 or 13, it was very unsettling. That experience is very deep within me. I felt I was at an, at an angle to society, not knowing what was going on. This is the situation for many of the children in her books. They've either moved to a new place or they are on holiday or somewhere unfamiliar. The main character in Westall's The Devil on the Road is an exception. He's older for a start and removes himself from his college and home life for the summer. But even he is provided with surrogate parents of a kind in the book, who together with other adults appear to manipulate him, what happens to him and put him into an isolated situation. The stories take place in evocative landscapes ancient buildings and archaeological sites and involved historical objects which have a resonance for the main characters. I'm going to focus on examples of Westall and Lively's work, first on strange happenings on the coast and second in the countryside. Westall's The Watch House begins with 15-year-old Anne arriving to spend the summer at her old nanny's house in the run-down seaside village of Gormouth. Her parents have split up and there is nowhere else for Anne to go. 
To keep her busy, she spends time with old Arthur in the Watch House, a massive old building which stands on a cliff overlooking the sea, which is based on the real Time Mouth Watch House, which you can see here. Arthur and the other members of the Garmouth Life Brigade used to watch for shipwrecks there and go out to rescue stranded sailors. Now the watch house is mainly used to store trinkets and relics self salvaged from shipwrecks past, ancient figureheads, parts of ships, bits of uniforms, even the bones of sailors who didn't get saved. Arthur tells Anne about the ghost of the old fella, a former member of the brigade whose ghost is said to haunt the building. Anne volunteers to clean, but as she does, she sees letters appearing in the dust, spelling out what looks like a plea for help addressed to her, just saying, Anne, help, over and over again. Lights go on and off by themselves, and a skull smashes its way out of a locked case. Anne becomes involved in the mystery, which seems to centre on the old fella, and the danger that he feels from another angry spirit, who seems to be associated with the skull. She also finds five desecrated graves in the cemetery around the ruins of Goldmouth Priory, based on Tynemouth Priory on the right here with the cemetery around it. The creature menacing the old fellow and the damaged graves appear to be connected with the wreck of a ship, the Hoplite, on, a, on the rocks below the Priory. Anne has many encounters with the supernatural on the headlands above the rocks, the memories of shipwrecks and rescues by the Life Brigade evoked by the old fellow. The Tynemouth Headland is a beautiful place in the light of a summer's day if you visit it, but eerie and remote feeling once the weather is gloomy, despite the fact that it is so close to the town. Penelope Lively's A Stitch in Time is concerned with the nature of time and how the past intrudes into the present. Maria arrives in Lyme Regis for a holiday with her parents, which she would seem as an exception to the isolation rule if it were not for the fact that they are likeable but distant people, slightly confused at being parents, it seems. She is an imaginative, imaginative only child who has a mind which possesses a degree of openness which makes her hear things which aren't there but were there once. As they arrive at the house in which they'll be staying, she hears the creak of a swing in the back garden and the small dog barking, but is disappointed to find none of these things when she goes into the back garden. She becomes fascinated by the fossils she finds in her room, neatly labelled, and by a sampler she sees in their landlady's house, stitched by a girl named Harriet Polstead in 1865, but finished by her sister. Maria does appear to briefly slip back in time for snatches of Harriet's life, but more often hears sounds associated with her, a piano being played, her sister calling for her turn on the swing, and the little dog barking. She also becomes obsessed with the idea that Harriet died as a child on the visit to, and on the visit to the seaside, hears the sounds of a dog barking in terror and a land, uh, the sounds of a landslip on the cliffs above the beach. So did Harriet die in a tragic accident? I'll now move away from the coast to the terrors that lurk in the heart of the countryside, and this is a quote from The Devil on the Road at the top. John Webster, the main character in The Devil on the Road by Robert Westall, believes in chance. He travels on his motorbike during the summer holidays from university, choosing his direction by the flip of a coin. However, after leaving a jammed road to Clacton, he finds himself trying to outrun a storm in Suffolk, getting lost in li little lanes and looking for shelter. He sees a building which he first identifies as a house, and then when he gets to it, as a barn. Sheltering inside, he rescues the kitten from a man trying to kill it with a bill hook, and is shocked by what he takes to be a Civil War reenactor, his motorbike helmet getting the worst of it. This is the first of the time slips that he experiences, which are somehow linked to the kitten, which he adopts and calls news. The kitten seems to be able to move between hidden rooms in the barn, which is indeed a former house, and between time periods. Gradually, John starts to feel that he's been set up by Derek Poodley, who owns the barn, who insists on him staying there, ostensibly to protect it from vandals, but clearly with an ulterior motive. The local villagers start to leave him gifts of food and calling him cunning when they speak to him, ask him for remedies for their Ill ills, and appear to be waiting for a woman from the past to arrive and live with him. John reads a book about witchcraft in Suffolk in the local second-hand bookshop, and realises that the villagers have turned him into their local cunning man 
he would have overseen witchcraft in the district. Because of the building he's staying in, not Faze's barn, but Vavasaur's house, thanks. The barn is gradually transformed by the gifts of furniture and repair work of the villagers, becoming more like the old house that it was during the period of the Civil War, as the story goes on. John tries to leave, but each time his motorbike engine cuts out and he's drawn back to the barn stroke house, and once more trapped in the time-slipping countryside, seeing a gibbet surrounded by a low circle of oaks one minute, then a mature <coughs> tree ring the next. A field with a line of people reaping corn is then transformed into its modern-day turnip field. And the longer he stays, the more he is forced into being an unwitting participant in the tragedies and persecutions of witches which exist in the building's past. Penelope Lively's Astacote takes a different approach to the influence of the past on the present, but it's no less hard-hitting in its effect. Mayor and Peter have moved to the village of Charlton Underwood from Wales with their family when their father becomes head teacher of the local school. They become fascinated by a nearby wood which is owned by a possessive farmer, but having followed their dog in there one day, they meet Guncher, the farmer's son, who is obsessed with looking after the place. He shows them the ruins of the village of Astacote within the wood, a village that died out due to the Black Death and the chalice buried there, which by its present is thought to protect the area from plain ever returning. The theft of the chalice causes mass hysteria amongst the Charlton Underwood villagers who are convinced that the plague is returning and it is up to the children and sensible local nurse of Agni to find it and calm the situation down. <coughs> While Mary's exploring the ruins, she can hear church bells, the rumbling of carts moving on the village roads, and the sounds of people going about their everyday lives. It's not time travel as such, but impressions built into the landscape around her. Looking across the fields by moonlight from her modern house, she sees the church with a cluster of houses around it. Then by daylight, there are the, only the trees of the wood covering it. Astacote was first published in 1970 and reflects the interest that Penelope Lively had in both history and folklore. However, the other thing that it reflects is an earlier view of the desertion of settlements in the medieval period and the belief in the late clearance of the wildwood. Astacote is referred to by one character as only having been constructed in a woodland clearance which previously blanketed the area. Beresford and Hurst in both editions of Deserted Medieval Villages, 1954 and 71, described the Black Death as having been the most popular explanation of a deserted site in folk local folklore, but that it should be deposed as um, being seen as the chief enemy of the village. They do, however, cite instances where documentary evidence shows that all the villain villains in the village died, such as Tusmore in Oxfordshire. While Lively definitely had an interest in history, she clearly found the popular explanation from folklore to be more dramatic than the social re-engineering of sheep farmers. There are many more examples that I could have used for this talk, such as Lively's The Whispering Nights, which featured those elements of the Rollwright Stones in Oxfordshire, or Alison Utley's A Traveller in Time, another example of a child sent to stay with distant relatives who <coughs> slips back and forth through time, experiencing the lives of the earlier inhabitants of the farmhouse. Or Charlotte sometimes, Penelope Farmer's story of Emily, again staying away from parents in a former boarding school, slipping back in time she becomes Charlotte, then a girl who died in her youth, and incidentally inspired a song by The Cure. Robert Westall wrote many stories which are based around spooky historic buildings or haunted features of the landscape, such as those you see here. Own Burial, misleadingly, while it borrows its title from the classic antiquarian text, is in fact a science fiction story about ancient intergalactic warfare. I was fairly obsessed with these books when I was growing up and rereading them in the context of being a landscape archaeologist has been a joy. The landscapes draw you in in the same way that they, uh, they are affecting the main characters until, like them, you're unsure what is real and what is imagined. As Maria says of Harriet in A Stitch in Time, the memories are there in the buildings and the landscapes, like the Ammonites in the rock, not here anymore, but here in a ghostly way because of the things she left behind. Thank you.